You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the Village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Welcome to an episode of the Formed and Sent podcast, a podcast by and for the Village Church that usually gathers in uh, downtown Hamilton, Ohio. My name is Scott. I'm one of the pastors of the Village, and uh, I'm not going to point this week because when I went back to look at the recording, I was pointing the wrong way on the recording than I was here. So I'm just going to say, Matt, would you uh, introduce yourself? My name is Matt. Thanks. I'm just here. One of the pastors yeah, of the Village Church. Uh, it's a privilege to be a part of this. And the other one? Matt Tucker. Matt Tucker. Is, my name is Michael Matt. Graham. Thanks for the uh, personal invitation. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, I'm one of the pastors as well. Yeah. Boom. Just one. Um, so we wanted to continue our uh, sermon series, your sermon series, our uh, our podcast series on uh, blowing dust off the Bible. Just wanted to chat about uh, for a few weeks, um, just some of the basic stuff about the scriptures. Maybe it's been a long time since you've opened up the Bible and really read, or maybe you just never have, um, or maybe you don't even know what the Bible is. Uh, maybe you're not even a believer, but just want to learn a little bit more, uh, at least from our perspective about uh, what it is and, and how we can uh, how we can read it or whatever. And so uh, last week we talked about just some of the basics of the Bible. So if you've not uh, seen that episode or watched, uh, listened to that episode, we'd encourage you to, to go do that. Today, um, we're going to talk about some of the major themes uh, in the Bible, like as we're reading. Um, just uh, we open up to a, a particular page, a, a book, a chapter or whatever. Um, where are we in the story of the Bible? How do we understand the, the big story of what it's trying to tell? And what are some of the things that um, some of the major themes or motifs or ideas that kind of carry throughout um, the scriptures that we can be aware of as we're reading? So we'll talk about some of those things today. Um, first, uh, if you are listening to this and you have a question uh, about the, the Bible, or maybe it's a, a topic for an episode down the road, um, we would love for you to send those to us. We're doing um, just a, a fun giveaway uh, during this series where if, if you send us a question, send us a topic idea, uh, then uh, you're entered automatically into uh, a drawing for uh, a, a bundle of resources from, uh, from us. So Matt and Michael and I, uh, maybe Adam, uh, Pastor Adam as well, will uh, kind of pick a, a resource about the Bible that we find particularly helpful. We're going to bundle those together and then one person gets to win uh, those things. So there's a form, uh, should be at the bottom of the description on this video, or if you're listening, uh, to this, it should be in the, the podcast show notes, um, as well, where you can enter, uh, your question and enter the, the giveaway. So, um, all right, to get into the topic for the day, uh, man, just before we go into maybe some of the nitty gritty stuff or some of the, the themes that we see throughout the scriptures, how would you guys briefly just summarize uh, the, the, the story of the Bible? Like briefly summarize it. Um, I know we've talked a lot at the village about creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. And I think one thing that's helpful, whether you've been a part of the church for a long time or not, is to know that, that God has always existed, that he is the creator of, of all that is. We believe that from the Bible. And just to go through that real quickly, and even our, in our own words, what that means is that, that when he set everything into place, he, he had a design for it, a plan of how it's supposed to go, and it was all perfect. And then we know the fall is the next part of that, and, and Adam and Eve, the, the big sin behind their eating of this fruit, which might not seem like a big deal, is that it's, it's mistrust in God's plan. God, is, God has a thing laid out. He is God. He knows everything, sees all. And, and they chose to say, God, I don't think that's what's best for me. We're going to go this route. And once they did that, that broke everything. And then in redemption, the, the, the majority of the rest of the Bible is God kind of calling a people to himself, calling a nation to himself. And, and he's weaving his plan to bring his people back to himself, to kind of unbreak what was broken. And there's a ton more than that. We see the cross in the New Testament, and he works through kings and rulers. But at the end of it, at one day, and we're not there yet, everything will be made new and that's something to look forward to that's something that is sure through the cross he has made that sure and he has won the war in a sense over satan and sin and death but we don't live fully in that new creation yet yes, yes. That's good. i mean i i uh, i affirm i i concur matt um, <laughs> I, I just I'll, I'll add one piece to that one um 
I say this all the time, but I'm a big picture person. And so for me, just having like grown into having an understanding when, when you first start reading the Bible, you, you, I mean, the reason why this resource I hope is helpful because it, you don't know where you fit. And, and so you just open the page of, of a book or a letter and, and understanding, you know, this matters because it, it, it gives context to what we read and, and discover. Um, so I, I love zooming way out and creation, fall, redemption, new creation, but in particular that the redemption part, and you hit on the fact that, that there's this one day. And so um, there are these bookends of, of glory and the bookends of uh, perfect harmony among creation. That's in the beginning and, and it lasts about two chapters. Uh, and then in the very, very, very end of the scripture, we see finally it comes back and you have this, uh, you know, ah, everything's like harmonious again. We live in the, the, the words that we used to describe this, the already, not yet. And so on this side of redemption, um, God is making all things new. He invites us into that. And, um, and one day all things will be made new. So there's a tension that we get to live in uh, lots of themes that we'll hit on maybe even in this podcast that, that help us understand how that plays out. So that, I love that, Matt. That was great. Yeah. I, I think there's a, uh, the, the idea of like, it's, it's at the end of the day, the big story is about God setting all things right back to the way that they're supposed to be. Um, and that's something that if, if you've not been in the Bible for a long time, never opened it before a, a misconception that I think a lot of people have about what the Bible's about is, oh, it's how to get right with God. <laughs> it's, it's how to live a really good moral life so that you can, you know, be good enough that he would love you. And it's not about you, like, making yourself right. It's the fact that God has made, has made you right through Jesus and that he wants to make all things right one day as well. And those are two totally different things. So understanding that kind of big picture story of the Bible really changes the way that you read it and what you're reading it for. And so to understand that the heartbeat of it is God setting out to, to not just go get his people back, um, but to set everything, like all of creation back right the way that it's supposed to be, um, that, that just shapes the way that we, that we read the scriptures and what we see going on as God interacts with humanity you know, throughout the pages. So, I, I love that. What, just one summary. We see um, probably a dozen times in the scriptures that I know as a preacher I've said, a hundred times that God will be God and his people will be his people. And I just love that that is the storyline that, that weaves in all these things that, that God is, he, he's God. And, and we uh, at times drift into knowing that and believing that and living accordingly. And we drift out of it, but, but God will be God. His people will be his people from cover to cover. That's the story. Yeah. Good. Speaking of that. So the Bible, like the Bible does contain the history of, God's people. So uh, when we crack open a book or a, a chapter or whatever, and we just start reading, like we may not know what's going on. <laughs> like yeah. where, depending on where you open, you're finding yourself in a different setting, a different place, a different thing that's happening in the history of God's people. And so maybe this is a, maybe, maybe it's a tall order to ask us to condense the story of the Bible <laughs> in some way or the history of God's people. Um, but uh, for, for those who maybe are less familiar or just less able to, to be able to say, hey, this is kind of what happens throughout the scriptures. Are there ways that you guys have found helpful to just remember? Um, or how do you tell maybe the, the, the whole story of the Bible? Again, not in, in a as succinct way as we just did, but not in a <laughs> going into, okay, this book's about, and this book's about, and this book's about. But like, is there a way you guys can, can maybe help unpack the general story of the Bible? So when someone opens it, they, they kind of maybe know where they fit. Um, for me, I know there's, like you said, it's got a, a lot of ways to consider this maybe and, and certain people's minds work differently and certain things jump out maybe in different ways. But for me, one of the ways is that I think of kind of like the bigger characters in the Bible and that's not, you know, just who's important, but they help me to remember the big chunks and of scripture around them. And so I think of like the first Adam that God created and he was perfect. He reflected Christ. And then, you know, he fell like we even alluded to in, in question one, but then you think of then, you know, time passes and God calls Abraham and he says, you know, Abraham, I'm going to, to build a nation out of you. I'm going to carry out my plan for redeeming the world and all the else that he wants to do through Abraham. And then I think of, you know, Abraham goes on and they go into Egypt, like we're, 
in right now with our sermon series, God brings them out. There's kings that come from him. We think of David then, that kind of, man, way into that. God uses him in a great way. David is another type of Christ. And we see how David, um, you know, rises and falls and, and sins and honors God. He points to the greater Jesus to come. And then you think of, I'm missing people, but, you know, the New Testament with Jesus coming, these, these big people help me to kind of tell a story of the Bible in a way that I can remember, I can piece together certain things. And I think it's through a family line for me that is kind of helpful to then bring other people into that as well. Yeah, that's great. So kind of thinking of the, the, the family line, the family yep. history, the, the big people throughout. Yep. What about you, Michael? Um, do you want to hit on your tricks there? Because I don't want to steal your thunder. Uh, Matt, do you want to go ahead and, and kind of spill into that next question a little bit? Um, I think, yeah, like the first Adam or um, the, the stuff you're talking about, or um, let's see. Man, I'm just, to be honest, I'm no, no, drawing no. a blank. Go ahead. You, no, you take cool. my I, trick if you got it, man. <laughs> One of the questions says, do you have any tricks to help remember oh. this? And so, um, so I think of it, I mean, there, there were some words that even you hit upon, and, and the majority of the, the key players that you described were like, it was as related to the covenant. Yeah. So God works through covenants and, and we'll get to this maybe in a bit, but like covenant is like a partnership. Uh, and, and many of the time it's like God establishes a relationship and he takes the onus mm -hmm. of, of working that out. And so when you look at those people, um, I think of it as a, uh, uh, it starts with one person, Abraham, and then it, it swells. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it swells into a family and then it swells into uh, a tribe uh, and then it swells into a, like a proper kingdom um, with a, with an earthly king. And so you have this, this one to many and it swells and swells and swells. And then you see over and over again that, that, uh, that they can't do it. No one can do what God is asking of them. And so it shrinks all the way back down uh, to one person and that one person's mm -hmm. Jesus and you see that kind of happen all again. And he invites his, his family and then his kingdom grows to be even greater than it was in the Old Testament. And that is all who call upon his name for, for all time. That's the kingdom that he's building. And so you have this, this idea of, of king and kingdom is one of the things that I think about this idea of, of covenant and, and interaction, this idea of, of creation and recreation. So, so there's, those are the few of the things that help me like, I just kind of guide where am I at? Mm -hmm. as I'm reading along in that. That's super helpful. Yep. Uh, for me, I think of um, which some of the newer folks to the village like have on their own independently ascribed to me the title of the gather and scatter pastor, uh, just because I literally say that every single week. But literally, this is the way that he's, I he's a about. He's a one trick pony, this guy. <laughs> that's all I got. That's all I got. Um, but that's what I, 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 that's what helps me think about the big story of the Bible is, uh, is God's people being where they're supposed to be, like in the land that God has given them. Uh, so, you know, God literally puts them in a garden at the beginning where he dwells with them. Uh, they sin, so they get booted out. So they're, now they're scattered where they're not supposed to be. Uh, Babel, you know, language confused. They scatter out uh, where, where they don't really belong. And then, yeah, to Matt, your point, God calls Abraham, hey, like, I want you to take you and your family and go to, to this land. This is land I'm going to give you. This is the promised land um, for you and for your family. I'm going to make a, a big family, a big nation out of you. And so they hang out there for a while. Uh, so they're, they're kind of home in some way, again, even though they own nothing. Uh, but then they have to, to, to go to Egypt because there's a famine, you know, generations mm -hmm. later. Go to, go to Egypt. So they're out of the promised land again. They become slaves. God frees them. Uh, that's Moses, kind of where we are right now in our current sermon series. They go back. Uh, eventually, they make their way to the promised land. Say hey, they're back again. Uh, generations go on. Um, things seem fine, but then they're not fine. The kingdom splits. All kinds of things happen. Uh, Assyria and uh, Babylon come in, conquer, exile, take them out of where they're supposed to be. Take them out of the promised land again uh, into Babylon few generations later, okay, fine, let go. They come back to the promised land. Um, and then that's kind of like, like the rebuilding phase is sort of where the Old Testament stops. And then there's like 400 years of, of quiet. And then the New Testament bursts on the scene. Jesus shows up um, and, you know, hey, like all the stuff that happened before, it's pointing to me, kingdom's here. Uh, but then as soon as Jesus, well, I mean, Jesus was a victim of persecution himself, but like the early church, uh, 
was was persecuted and so they literally are scattered and we hear about you know peter in particular talks about kind of the the exiles that the church is exiled because they've all kind of scattered out from where they're supposed to be um and and yet we look forward to that day when when jesus returns and he is going to once again gather all of his people together once for all uh with him in the place where they're supposed to be and you get this this image of a new city a new jerusalem coming down and that's where his people gather and so just kind of the, the rhythm throughout the scriptures of seeing god's people get booted out and come back and booted out and come back and that's just for me like that that helps me remember the kind of the heartbeat of the story um from old to new testament so that's really good man i like it when you guys were talking about that um i know we hit on some different things but some of the things were similar and it made me think of, I actually had to look for it because I didn't know exactly which chapter it was, but in Acts 7, Stephen is getting stoned, and he has this account, and he just weaves together the big points of the Bible so well for those who are listening. And oh, when yeah. you guys are talking about that, that literally made me think of that, and he hit on some, I didn't read it all right here, but he hit on some of those big thoughts. So if you're listening and you're trying to say, oh, what did Scott say or what did Michael say or whatever, Acts 7 is a place where you can kind of get a snapshot of the Bible that Stephen nails those big points kind of in one one message in, in, in one chapter for us. Yeah, that's really great. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, it is. Yep. Um, so as people are flipping through the pages of the Bible reading, that's, so we, we kind of talked about recounting the history of God's people. Um, folks who are reading uh, might be wondering where they themselves kind of fit into that story. Obviously, from a historical perspective, uh, we have not yet been born. <laughs> but like, <laughs> As we're, as we're like looking at either the, not just the history, but like the big picture that we talked about at the beginning, kind of where do we fit in to, to this story of God's people and the big story of, of the Bible, what it's trying to tell? Um, for me, I kind of answered this in, in two parts. First of all, I think we get to see ourselves um, through many of the, the characters in the Bible. When we look at Pharaoh in our sermon series now, we get to see how we are much like him and how we have idols in our own lives or we think that we are the one in control and all throughout the Bible we can relate to people who are not the heroes because we are broken we are fallen and so even as the children of Israel like you mentioned Scott they they're fine for a little while then they leave we can identify with with maybe feeling like we're hey we're healthy with God today and all of a sudden tomorrow we're just way over there and, and believing things that we shouldn't believe so that's yeah. kind of the first point we get to see ourselves in light of those characters and how they struggle and then the second thing is, though, we get to see ourselves in light of, well, the Bible does talk about the church in the New Testament and how, you know, the church is those who are bought by Christ, but waiting for, again, like we talked about, the new creation to happen. And they have a mission from God that God says, hey, take, take what you know, take, take what you know of me, Jesus, and share that with the world. And so we get to see ourselves certainly in those people who are through the Bible that struggle and fail and need Jesus, but we also get to see ourselves as those who are redeemed, purchased, and bought with a mission, looking forward to one day when we won't have to do this anymore and we'll be with Christ. Yeah, that's great. I don't have anything to add to that. I mean, that, I, I had the, the words relate to, that's really good, Matt. Um, I, I think it's it's tough to consider what it looks like reading the Bible without, you know, without a, a, a lens of, of the whole thing. But um, one of the things that we say all the time uh, as historically around the village is, is God is holy, man is sinful, and Christ is sufficient. And we talk about that in terms of salvation, but but really you could plunk that in any chapter of, of all of the scriptures. And if you remember that, that, that you're not the one, to your point, Scott, that's that's earning anything, and mm-hmm. um, but, but we're the one receiving everything. And as we're going through Exodus right now, we see uh, we see God's mighty work to save his people. Um, and, and those people who are his are, 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 I'm sorry, those people who are his are his by faith and trusting his, his great work and, and his mighty hand. We see the same thing in the New Testament and it, and it takes shape in the, in the cross and, and Jesus doing the work. And so anywhere along that paradigm, there is this idea of, of, uh, of rescue, of, of those in need of saving and, and savior. And so if we think, we read in creation or all the way through, man, in this moment, I'm finding myself where God is holy and man, I am, I am sinful and yet Christ is sufficient. It will help us just kind of like I orient ourselves around the right players and not always just inserting ourselves as, you know, 
Joseph the faithful or, or, or Job the faithful or, or Jesus. I'm just like, you know, that, that's not how we read the Bible. So, mm-hmm. good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think of, uh, I think it's in Romans 11. Paul talks about kind of like the family of God almost is like a tree and how um, I'm assuming most of us who are either watching this or listening to, to this are are not like messianic Jewish believers, but are probably Gentiles, like non-Jews who came to meet Jesus. And so like for us, uh, we, we see the, uh, this family tree um, kind of that, that Matt alluded to that we kind of, we can trace throughout the Old Testament, like all the promises and everything else that were, that God made to them, the covenants that were made, all that stuff. Um, man, like that was made to one particular group of people. Um, that was Israel. But Paul on Romans 11 says like, hey, like one of the, the beautiful things about the gospel is, is, hey, this is open to anybody and everybody. And so even those outside of uh, Judaism, like outside those who were like uh, from like Abraham or whatever, get to be grafted into that tree. And so as we are reading through the pages of, you know, the Old New Testament, um, the, the, the promises that were made to God's people throughout man, like those get to be ours, ours as well, in terms of those, those promises that are fulfilled in Christ. Um, so, uh, I just think that's like a, that's a cool thing for us to see is that, um, man, we, we are part of God's people. We are a fulfillment of the great commission that, you know, Jesus sent his first disciples on. And yet we're also disciples that are commissioned to do the same thing. And so like, we're part of that, what, what is now like a very large family tree, you know, that extends back for thousands of years. Um, yeah. And so we get to kind of find ourselves, uh, in the family of God, just like those who've come before us and those that we're reading about just kind of really cool. So, so, um, man, like we, we talked last week about, uh, and even today about the Bible, like being, um, even though it's, uh, multiple different books, uh, multiple different authors, different genres, all that stuff. It is, it's one story. Um, it's trying to communicate many, many things, but there is an, an interwoven story as well of, um, you know, creation, fall, redemption, new creation, all the things that we've talked about. So in the midst of kind of that story, uh, there are, there are going to be themes, there are going to be ideas, uh, motifs, tensions, things that kind of unfold over time that um, as, as we're reading, like kind of help if we pay attention to, to them, kind of help us understand what's going on and, and maybe some of the big threads throughout the scriptures. And so we want to hit on some of those uh, and, and we might bounce around to other different things based on the list that we have here or whatever. Um, but I uh, wanted to just kind of talk about some of those things. So as you're reading, you might catch something that's like, hey, that's like a, that's a big idea throughout the Bible. And I, I want to remember that. So uh, we have several of these. The, the first that I wanted to talk about uh, is Revelation, just the idea that God kind of reveals himself to his people. How do we see that kind of play out throughout the scriptures? Um, one, uh, and this might go without saying, but we're not just talking about the last book of the Bible, which is called <laughs> Revelations, um, but but those are Revelations as well. Um Man, I had a conversation this week, and, and I don't think it was public. Uh, I don't think it was like on last week's podcast, although it may have been. Um, just about the idea that that we have a whole lot of revealed wisdom from God to this point. That when we read in hindsight, we read, for example, the way God calls Abraham. He didn't have that. And so you look at it and you, you say, man, why on earth is he... Uh, trying to have a baby with someone that's not his wife, you know, doesn't he know what Paul said in, you know, Corinthians or, you know, whatever. Um, and, and while I think we can assume that that wasn't a, a, a wise move on, on Abraham's behalf, um, it's, we can't just add all that we have beyond that point to the people of God in that time. That is a helpful consideration that we have revelation, special revelation from God that they didn't have. So it's just kind of a helpful way as you read along. But um, but we see many times when, when God reveals himself, especially as we talked about last week, through the scriptures, through the spirit, through the prophets, through the apostles. Um, and then there's this general revelation that God is just makes himself known through nature and, and through other things. And so um, 
and, and one part that we get to play in God's revelation is we get to proclaim. And so how does God make himself known? Well, he does it through his word in special ways. Um, that is his special revelation. He does it through nature. And when people look at a sunset, they find themselves thinking, no way we can be alone. No way this could be an accident or, or whatever. But, but we, get to, we get to help tie those things together. And we get to point to the special revelation from God, his word. And we get to boldly make him known by preaching truth with clarity um, from the scriptures. So. Well, good, man. I like it. That's good. I had all I had. Um, so, I mean, that, I won't try to add anything else to that. I think it is helpful to know that as it regards to Revelation being the last book of the Bible, and in regards to special revelation, that is stopped, right? And so God doesn't continue through his word to add anything else to who he is. Everything that is in the Bible is there and is perfect. And that's all we need, all God has given for us to know about himself. But we can continue to learn about him through like community, how we see, you know, how we look at different people and how we see God gift them or how they respond or just through God's character. And I think also just through nature, like you said, we have to continue to just be in awe. Every day I go out in the backyard or see a sunset, you're just reminded of who God is and, and how powerful he is and how he holds everything together. I know we were talking with Micah about something. This might sound like really dumb, but was, we were watching the grass blow. And I said, you know, Micah, God is in complete control of every blade of grass blowing in the wind. And I just think that even that we just get to be reminded of, of that revelation of who God is and how he works and that he's just this amazing God. Yeah. Let me ask you, Matt, was your son, Micah, was he like, oh my gosh, are you serious, dad? Or was no. he like, <laughs> it was one of those things that was just kind of one and done and, we, you know, whatever, but we're, we're trying. So good. Love that. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, like the almost like the peeling back of layers in terms of God revealing Himself to to His people over time. I, I think about uh, Him like revealing His name, you know, kind of to to Moses. Hey, my name my name is Yahweh. Like I am doing it. Like that's a big deal, you know. Um, Exodus thirty four. I think he he like kind of gives his self disclosure of like, hey, uh, I'm slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, all those things. Um, you know, dwelling with his people in terms of, uh, you know, we talked about like uh, just in Exodus, the, the pillar of mm -hmm. cloud and, and fire and all those things and just kind of continuing to, to reveal himself over time uh, all the way to Jesus where literally I think Colossians talks about him being like the impression, the imprint, full imprint of God come like dwelling in the flesh. And so mm -hmm. Jesus says, hey, like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, the Spirit, like, being uh, indwelling in us, those who believe, um, and illuminating for us, helping us learn who God is and remember who God is as we read the scriptures, all the way to Revelation, you know, where, hey, Jesus is, is revealed in all of his glory, all of his majesty, uh, and and we get to see him face to face. Yeah. First Corinthians 13, like, hey, for right now, like we know in part and we prophesy in part and all those things are just in part, but one day we'll get to know fully and we'll mm -hmm. get to see fully. And so there's just kind of this like layered peeling back throughout the scriptures of God, making himself known in new ways and deeper ways to his people, which is just cool. I love that. Um, what about like creation, uh, new creation, um, God dwelling with his people, like temple, like all that stuff. How do we kind of see that play out throughout the scriptures? Um, man, just some thoughts. Um, nothing that's probably full picture, but creation, I think, kind of maybe mimics our relationship with God, how we both started out being made by God. So creation is made by God, and humans are a part of that creation. And when humans chose to then sin, we broke, something inside of us broke, and also there was a curse put on creation, and creation kind of broke in a sense as well, and there was a, it was submitted to a curse as well. And as we see then through the, the rest of the Bible, the referring and bringing like the dwelling in the temple, God is wanting to then rebuild the, the relationship that was broken through with humans and also with creation. And we see him, you know, like you said, the pillar of cloud, he makes himself known. And we see the temple and the, or the tabernacle that the people in the, the desert kind of roll up and spread out and God meets with them. And there's a, a permanent temple in David's time. And then 
you know, at one point it's, it's destroyed in the new Testament. And God says, now, now the temple lives inside of those who, who know and believe in, in the work of Jesus. And, and as we, I said, like humans kind of, kind of maybe parallel creation being broken at one point, God will fix, you know, as he's fixed us, he will also fix creation at the end. So I kind of see this like parallel like that going, well, you know, they tie together pretty well. And at the end, Revelations 21, I think brings these two thoughts together. Um, it says, now the dwelling of God was, is with men and he will live with them and they will be his people and he will be their God. And it talks about how at one point, again, like we've already mentioned throughout this whole thing, the, the creation culminates in this thing and also him dwelling with us culminates together in a perfect environment. It's pretty cool. That's great. That's so good. I, the only thing I would add is, is our, uh, our work then is, is restorative that, that maybe it's not just this one day that he's going to make all things well, but he, he already began. Mm -hmm. uh, he already yeah. began to restore. And that was the work of redemption at the cross. And so that was the, uh, the bottom of, uh, of the worst, uh, Jesus on the cross and by his life, then everything else is, is trajectory mm -hmm. towards uh, that new heavens and new earth. So, um, so when we look at, you know, Israel's role as a lighthouse in the old Testament, that was, uh, them to man to be made in, in, uh, in a way that pointed to God as creator and his goodness and, and human flourishing. The church now, like you said, uh, being being temples of the Holy Spirit inside of us, we get to put that those glimpses of the one day on display, mm. um, and and so we get to actually join the restorative work um, on this side of the cross, and and one day He will, man, He will judge all perfectly and and literally restore all things, uh, and, and it began with you know a city around a tree, and it will end a city around a tree. It's yeah. just I love that. Yeah, I think when you have those bookends in mind, it's then really easy to see. It, it's a lot easier to see, oh, like God's wanting to to make this happen again. He wants to be back with his people, like in this place again. And so from the garden to to God, like, hey, I want to dwell with you in a tent, uh, to uh, tabernacle, to, to a temple, to um, Jesus himself, God in the flesh, like showing up to us being made a temple so the spirit can dwell in us to, Hey, like God wants to remake this thing and dwell with us face to face again. Like that theme is just throughout, uh, throughout all of, of the Bible. And I think creation ties into that in the sense that man, like just as we are sinful and, and unclean creation is too. And so we see weird things like, you know, when God shows up to Moses in the burning bush is like, Hey, this ground is holy. Take off your sandals or whatever. Like, like it's, it's not just us that's unclean, but it's, it's like the space too. And so you might read about, you know, things being unclean or food being unclean or this being unclean. There's all sorts of stuff that we don't understand about that. But at the end of the day, like the reality is that God uh, gets to dwell in a place that's holy, like he can't dwell anywhere else. And so he, he not only comes to, to, to dwell with his people, but he also comes to make not just us, but his creation clean so that he can. Um, and that's one of the beautiful promises that we see, you know, again, like revealed over time through the covenants, Ezekiel 36, like I'll sprinkle water on you and do all this stuff and make, make, take away your uncleannesses and make you clean. And then I'll put my spirit within you, a uh, new heart in you and cause you to walk in my ways and, and I'll be your God and you'll be my people. Just seeing that throughout is just really cool. I love that. Great. Um, speaking of covenants, uh, man, we see, so we see, we do see covenants like made throughout, uh, the scriptures. Um, Michael, you hit on that in terms of kind of your, your big narrative of old, the, like the, the story of the Bible, the history of God's people. What's that look like? What do we see throughout the Bible in that? Yeah. I mean, we just see these, these moments of partnership, uh, Adam and Eve, um, you know, he's, uh, they sin and, and he makes an, an arrangement with them and that one day like it's going to be better but that day's that day's not today and he sends them out of the garden closed and, and then we see Noah where God just, just destroys everyone except for Noah and his family and he says uh you know but 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 just rest assured and, and I mean rest assured because you don't have to do anything I'm not going to do this again and and I'm going to man essentially restore creation 
through your line. And, and if it were up to Noah, uh, that would not have happened because he's, you know, in, in 10 minutes, he's, he's uh, hitting the bottle a little hard and, you know, and we just find some weird stuff. And so no one would read that story and think, Oh, I see why God chose Noah. Cause he's like, what, you know, it, it's just, but, but God is, is faithful to his promises. And then we see Abraham and he says, I'm going to make a nation as numerous as the stars. And that happens at, at odds with anything that Abraham thought would happen. Like I'm, I'm an old man, you know, there, there's nothing coming from my loins or from my laughing wife's loins. Like it's not going to happen. And yet it happens in, in real life and then it happens in a, a spiritual way in Christ. And then uh, as things move on, we see uh, Moses and the covenant at Mount Sinai. And, and that's really when he begins to describe what goodness is. And that's what I was alluding to earlier. Um, we see in, in his covenant with, with Israel through Moses at Mount, Mount Sinai, it's, he's, he begins to like make a list of, of good things and not good things, of clean things and not clean things to really show them that, man, there's no way in your hands that you are going to be able to, to walk in my holiness. You cannot do it. Um, and they try at times and they, they fail. And, and then we see that, that kingdom grow. And David, again, somebody else, these aren't people with impeccable records of morality. Uh, he chooses David, who's an adulterer and a murderer. And, and, he, and he says, look, uh, this kingdom, these same promises that I made through Abraham and, and on and on, and I'm making with you, and there is going to be a greater king, and this kingdom is going to last forever, and it's going to come through your line. And so when we look at all that, um, then then that, that's kind of the five uh, Old Testament covenants. And then we see um, as if all those things are, are hitting a, a bumper of like, it seems like hopeless because just God's people, they just don't, they just don't handle his, this partnership. Well, we're not good business partners, right? Mm-hmm. Um um, but then you have the end of the Old Testament, and, and, and you have the prophets redirecting the kings and kingdoms, all, all this stuff. And then you have, like, the, as I said, all those things are trajectorying down. And then in, in Jesus, you have this, this new covenant. Uh, it, it is the New Testament or the new covenant. And in him, although we still mess it up, the trajectory is, is upward. And so those are just kind of some helpful partnerships and arrangements that we get to see God faithfully deliver on throughout the scriptures that's really cool um you said this and i'm just touching on one point that was helpful to me um as i learned in the last couple of years is like all those covenants in the old testament where god were, certainly for noah is kind of one-sided where god said i'm going to do this but in the other ones god said kind of if you obey me then then i will do this or then this is how it will go and what's cool is is in the new testament God kind of fulfills both sides of the covenant. He is the one that obeys perfectly through his son, Jesus, in his perfect life. So he fulfills our side. And he also then carries out the side that he said he would do. And like you said, for that, for the new covenant is just a beautiful thing. And I think like, I don't even know the half of it yet. And it's still unpacking it and learning, but it's just a beautiful thing to see how God over and above just shows mercy and grace and fulfilling both sides of the covenant in, in the new Testament. I think that's, I mean, yeah, as you're reading that stuff, it's a, it's not an opportunity to watch how faithful God's people are and like, (laughs) you know, Hey, make sure you do what this guy does. It's, it's all those covenants are opportunities for God to show his faithfulness to his people, even when we're not. So beautiful thing. Uh, What about, so kind of speaking of promises, God, God makes covenants, makes promises with his people. Um, And so this is a, maybe a weird thing maybe it seems like a god's being unfair or whatever throughout the old because he's he's clearly favoring and choosing a people for himself and so this is something that we see we saw it in again in exodus uh over and over again with the plagues that god made a distinction between the egyptians and the israelites and he makes distinctions between his people and not his people throughout kind of the old testament um and into the new and so like how do we see that play out or what does that look like throughout the course of the bible i think we continue to see like you set up scott god choosing people um, and it's not based on their works or their merit but we see even in noah how basically god comes to him and says you're going to do this we see in abraham how abraham probably wasn't a believer and god calls him says abraham i want to do this in you and through you we see it throughout the whole Bible, how David, you know, they, they, the, the Israelites 
saw King Saul and said, this is the guy. He's strong. He's powerful. He's tall. He is our king. And God says, well, I'll let you do your thing. And then he, God selects from a, a, a shepherd boy named David to then be part of his plan and continue it on. Even in the New Testament, I, I know we talk about Paul sometimes being one of the most radically changed people due to God choosing him, a person who was against Christ, against Christianity, against anything to do with God. And in, in one instant, God obviously changes Paul's whole trajectory of his life from being against him to all of a sudden believing in him and being one of the greatest missionaries of all time. And so I think it's just cool to see how I, even from Jacob and Esau, you know, Jacob, I've loved Esau. I've hated it. God, I think he uses that language. And so it's cool to see through the whole Bible, God's consistency in choosing people who probably wouldn't have chosen him. We know that, but in choosing God uses them, not because of, them, of their ability, but a lot of times because of their inability and then that God gets the glory for that. Yeah. Uh, that's great, Matt. I love that summary. I, I think there is this tension, um, and we won't resolve it in the next 30 seconds, but of, of God's try. work, yeah, <laughs> Scott will, of God's work and, and man's responsibility. That's a, that's certainly a tension for capitalistic, uh, Americans, but I think that's, that's a tension for all of people. Um, and, and so when you interact with the pages of scripture and the characters of history, and it, like it makes you scratch your head, and you're saying, "But why? Why would he? Why would he choose him and and not him? I mean, it's just, and so that that puts a con, kind of a confusing thing, and and it can make us think that God is robotic, and and he's you know zapping people into a trance to, and and you know that that doesn't seem to be the case, um, but we see him controlling the the hearts of kings like water in his hand, and and then we see uh, seemingly people have full reign to respond to him however they would and so it's important that that we don't uh, just encamp ourselves in theological circles but we see that tension and i'm fine to, to kind of let that tension hang out there that that no one comes to trust god without god first opening their eyes uh, and and that's explicit in the scriptures uh, and yet god does not open everyone's eyes also explicit in the scriptures so then you might come to a place that says well what about what about me or what about my neighbor? And, and we don't have to know uh, all of the things that I look at salvation, like a, you know, the classic uh, uh, iceberg underwater. And, you know, we see like the tiny tip of it and then it's this big, you know, that's in every third grade classroom um, in the country. Uh, and, and so like you see that and that's the way I look at salvation. But really, even if we only see the tip of the iceberg, literally, we still have the same responsibility and that's to hear what God is saying through his special revelation and the proclamation of his church empowered by the spirit um, and respond to it and reject him or trust him. Yeah. And so, uh, man, I'm, you know, none of us would downplay those tensions. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. Scott, clear it all up. What do you got? <laughs> One of my favorite uh, passages. I read this to the kids uh, the other night. It's from Deuteronomy seven. Um, I think it's six through eight. Uh, it says, for you're a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you are the fewest of all peoples. But it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And so if you kind of cut out all the clauses and everything in between, it literally says uh, it was uh, not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you, uh, but it's because the Lord loves you. <laughs> so like, oh, yeah. like he loves you because he loves you. He loves his people because he loves his people and he's committed to him and he's faithful to him. And those who are set against his people, he's against them as well because he loves his people um, but then we also see this thread that is, is hinted at, like it's there throughout the Old Testament, but then made explicit. Paul calls it a mystery of the gospel that's made explicit uh, through Jesus that, man, it, people that aren't uh, an Israelite are welcome to, to become part of God's covenant people. Um, we saw like a, a mixed multitude leaving Egypt. Again, we're in Exodus. We saw them 
leaving out. It wasn't just the Israelites that left. It was some of the people that were like, hey, <laughs> I want to I wanna side myself with this God too. And that went with him and they're invited to partake in the feasts and to be circumcised and all that stuff. So like we see in and like this whole idea of election or God choosing or whatever that, yeah, he is, um, he is radically devoted to a people and he loves them. Um, but while he's like, it, it might seem like he's very exclusive. Um, he's also radically inclusive because there's no one on the face of the earth, uh, explicitly now because of the gospel uh, of Jesus that we have clear, like there's no one that's not invited to, to, to trust Christ. To, to put their life and their death in his hands. Um, and so like it, that being the case, like it's, it, it might seem as you're going throughout the Bible that man, God is exclusive in this part, but he's, he's really like, he's inclusive to all. If, if you would let him be your God so that, that you would be able to be his people, you know? So That's good. Uh, in terms of kingdom, um, Again, you kind of hit on, both of you guys kind of hit on a little bit, uh, Michael, you in particular, like how do we see the theme of kingdom go throughout the scriptures? Nope. <laughs> I apologize. Thanks so much, guys. Um, one of the things we see is we kind of see this like Satan's rule over the over the earth, and I believe that he has a kingdom that is unfortunately alive and well still, even though, you know, he's under kind of God's power and almost on a leash, as we would say. And then we also see that, that God from all time has been ruling and reigning and in full control over everything. And there is this tension, like it, through the Bible and even now, as we're so, I guess, technically in Bible times, that, that the Bible kind of calls the earth Satan's realm or Satan's dominion and Satan still has power over it. He still roams around like a lion, singing who he can devour. And by God's grace, he has come through the cross and, and broken Satan's power. He's enacting his kingdom and invites us into his kingdom. And it's our job to reveal this new kingdom. And one day, Satan's whole kingdom will be wiped out and destroyed. And there'll be nothing left of it. And God will be the only kind of gig in town, which will be wonderful. But we kind of still wrestle with, even though Satan has been depowered a little bit, there's still these two kingdoms kind of warring against each other. And so I think those are kind of the main ones. I know that we even at the village talk about like the kingdom of ourself. And sometimes we choose to be God. I think even that though kind of gets wrapped under the kingdom of Satan, because ultimately if we're worshiping ourselves in our own kingdom, then we're ultimately still under kind of believing the lie that Satan believed. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ditto. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I think it's um, tough. Uh, I mean, we don't, us anyways, we don't live in a, a monarchy. And so the idea of like one person having all the power is like the thing that's like Americans worst nightmare <laughs> is someone oh, consolidating power. What could go wrong? They said, <laughs> what, what could go wrong? <laughs> I know. Let's give everyone a little bit of power. That'll go way better. Um, so anyways, uh, the the idea of kingdom might seem a little bit foreign, but like at the same time, it's a pretty simple idea to understand there's a king um, who's in charge of everything and you're either for him or you're against him. Um, and I mean, from the, the time of, uh, well, I mean, even, even, with, uh, even with Abraham, God saying, I'm going to establish not just a family, but a nation. There's this idea of, okay, there's going to be a national identity. Um, and then God, for the longest time, like, like Israel was a theocracy. God was their king um, throughout the Old Testament until they decided they wanted a human king instead, um, which didn't go as they, uh, they really wanted to. But, but the idea that, man, there is a, uh, while there's, there's not necessarily a theocracy right now of God's people right now of the church, um, Jesus is still our King. And so when you open up the new Testament and see that in, in large part, the gospel that Jesus proclaimed was a gospel of the kingdom, that the kingdom of God was at hand, um, that it was here. Uh, that's because Jesus was arriving and he was the one who was going to usher in this new kingdom. And he was the, the, uh, the, the yin to the, the, <laughs> to, to Satan's yang. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and we see that actually he defeated, him. And so as, as members today of God's people, like Jesus is our King. Yeah. We're 
citizens of whatever or part of whatever country we're a part of. But at the end of the day, like our citizenship, our allegiance belongs to Jesus. Um, and, and we see that teased out in the New Testament or whatever. And so, yeah, that's, that's just a, that this rising power um, that was lost when sin entered the world and God's kind of reign uh, in our hearts ended because of sin. Like Jesus, God has set out from the Old Testament and fulfilled that in Jesus to actually reclaim uh, our, our hearts for him and to let him set his reign reign through us. So uh, what about redemption, uh, salvation, the idea of like a coming Messiah, all that? How do we see that throughout the Bible? You want to go, Matt? Or? I'm, I'm good with either way. Um, from redemption to salvation, I think it's important to know why there is a need for redemption. And so I kind of just opened up with talking about how we, again, as probably most of those who are listening know, we sinned. And in doing so, we kind of willingly enslaved ourselves to to evil and to, to Satan in, in, in a way, as kind of jumping from the last thing we talked about with kingdoms. And so therefore, there's a need because we are not our own anymore. And we're going through this st study again in um, Exodus, where we can see ourselves as the nation of Israel enslaved to Egypt, where they were unable then to free themselves. And just like we have willingly enslaved ourselves to sin, we aren't able to all of a sudden be perfect. We're not able to free ourselves. We need something greater than ourselves to rescue us and to free us. And so there's the need for redemption. And so all throughout the Bible, again, we see sacrifices kind of almost as a picture of something that is helpful, but not fully able to do that. It kind of points towards the ultimate redemption of Jesus on the cross. And so um, that's why we look to Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah, um, the predicted one, the one that's kind of foreshadowed all the way through the Old Testament, through sacrifices, through slavery, through rescuing, all of that. Um, and it's important to know that we could never pay the price for our freedom. And that's why Christ gave of himself to purchase that for us, hence the redemption, hence Jesus as our Savior and, and Messiah. That's great. I mean, just we're, we're always thirsting. We're always longing for one who can deliver. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves always in rescue because of the broken world. And so if you just look at movies, books, stories, uh, I allude to the Matrix, I think, in last week's sermon. I mean, they're looking for the one, the rescuer, the, the one to save everyone. And so I think what uh, compounds that in the scriptures is God is like dropping these breadcrumbs through his covenants and through his promises, like, oh, but there is one who is greater, and oh, but there is one who is greater. Like, oh, is it is it Saul? It must be Saul. He's the one. It, no, it's not Saul. You know, it, is it David? Well, David was great. No, it's not David. And so it's just always like, uh, and sometimes when we swerve from faith, and this is what those who live outside of uh, of the kingdom of God, Jesus rules everything, but but if, he, if we don't allow him to rule and reign in our hearts, then, then we're going adrift. We're a law unto ourselves. Then, then we're saying that, that that's us, that we are the rescuer. And we can either, we can either chase that by moralism, and I'm going to please God, and I'm going to do all the things right, uh, you'll fail. Or, or you chase that by making up your own rules and making up your own kingdom standard, and you just reject God altogether. All those things always lead us to despair because there is no redemption apart from God and his work through Jesus. And so that is that is the, he is the long awaited uh and and so up until the point that he lived uh and he died and he rose they were they were hoping for a messiah and then on the other side of him we look back and we say he is the one and one day he will come or we reject that altogether and say you know the the non messianic jews they look and they say surely he's still coming um and or or you just reject it altogether and say no oh, he's here he is me yeah. And from Genesis three, I mean, I love when God is like actually giving curses to, to Adam and Eve and the serpent, uh, the very beginning of the Bible after they've sinned, uh, for the first time, God literally tells them that like a, a, an offspring, like someone from the seed of Eve is going to, to crush the head of the snake, even though the snake bites the, the heel of the offspring. And so that right there, like, is pointing to someone who's going to come in the future, a son who is going to actually, like, defeat this enemy that deceived us and tricked us in the garden. And so 
like Michael, to your point, there's always someone being alluded to that's greater, you know, like when God says, Hey, Abraham, like, like, can you count the grains of sand or can you count the, the star, like the stars in the sky? Hey, that's how many people are going to be in your family. And you're like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I can have that many kids or I don't know if I can, I, my nation can be that big, you know? Mm-hmm. And well, that's because it's pointing forward to something that's even bigger and greater or, you know, David, that his throne, like, man, never going to get off, right? There, there's somebody coming that never going to get off your throne from your line or whatever. Well, I mean, that, that assumes that someone's like not ever going to die. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's a, that's a pretty long living King, you know, to have like an eternal reign or whatever. And so we just see these things pointed to and alluded to throughout the scriptures that, that are constantly pointing to a redeemer, someone greater who's going to rescue us in a bigger way and a better way. And that's ultimately culminated, you know, in Jesus. So uh, what about the distinction between law and gospel, law and gospel? Oh man, a lot of, a lot of stuff there. Um, The, moral legalist would try to earn God um, by keeping all the rules. Um, and man, the church is, is really good at being a moral legalist. We see that in the New Testament and the, and the, the Pharisees. And, and you would think that, um, man, they would be the ones respected in the community and the ones that J- Jesus would say, oh, man, I got to watch what I say because I got to earn those guys respect. But what happened was he just went up and, and just punched him in the mouth and, and, uh, and, and gut punches seemingly every day. Those were his foes, the religious people who, who looked apart and dressed apart uh, and maybe even lived the part apart from their heart longing um, to, to be with God. And so they were using their religiosity as power through the law. Um, and so that man, there's so much to say. The other side of that is grace is, is just uh, the pure gift of God and, and what we find out, I'll let you guys clean this up. But what we find out is that, that the law doesn't earn us God. There's no ladder you can climb. There's no moral uh, complexity or perfection that you could do to achieve um, that you could achieve God or his affirmation or his blessing or, uh, um, or if you, if you're hinging your life to him saying, well done, good and faithful servant, you may enter into my, to my eternal rest, my eternal home. And you think that you're good enough by his standard of holiness to do that. Uh, then you're looking at it. You're looking at it wrong. In fact, what the law does and what the Bible teaches is that it is, it is a tool that points us to grace. And, and what we find out what the law does is it shows us where we fail. And, and when we fail, we fall down. And when we fall down, that points us to the foot of the cross where grace is given without uh, without end, without ceasing, without, but it's a, you know, it's, it's a red robin bottomless fries, although it's God's <laughs> blessing, you know, it's not fries. Uh, it's, 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 it just never, his grace never ends to us because of the work of Jesus. I agree. I was looking back and I knew there's some massive number of laws that God gave his people in the old Testament. And I think it's like 613 laws. And again, the purpose too, like Mike, what you said was certain to reveal that that we are sinful and that we're unable to keep the law, but also the law was good in that it, it showed us how to live with God and it showed us how to also get along with other people. And like you said, yeah, we were unable to do that. And what's cool is today, obviously Jesus fulfilled that perfectly for us, but we are still, we have the opportunity when we're, we're called to still obey God and all of his laws, but not to earn God's love, but because we have God's love. And so we don't have to fear all of a sudden if we, we sin today that like lightning will strike and whatever, but we get to be forgiven. We get to repent of our sin, knowing that that doesn't take away our salvation or all of a sudden break our relationship with God again. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. When you hear of like, you know, David, like delighting in the, in the law of the Lord, or it's like, Oh, it's like honey, you know, yep. it's, it's yep. so sweet. And <laughs> like, I, I think even, even a lot of Christians like, even a lot of Christians are like, no, that like the law is bad, like law bad, gospel good, you know? And it's like, no, the law is actually really good. The ministry of the law, like if we let that be the only thing that ministers to our hearts, it's going to condemn us because mm-hmm. we're going to fall short of it every single time. When the gospel ministers, ministers to us, like it gives us grace and life. Um, but the law itself is good because it, it does show us, it reveals God's heart for 
for us, but it also shows God's heart for us and how we ought to, to have a heart for other people too. Yeah. And so like, if you're reading through Leviticus or any, any of the old Testament and come across the law, it's going to sound bonkers and crazy and not make sense. Um, man, but we shouldn't just skip over it and leave it alone. Part of it is what Michael hinted at with revelation earlier that, Hey, like God was, God was speaking to a people who were accustomed to this certain way of life and these certain sins and these certain evils and these certain things and what might to us seem like crazy and heinous or whatever was actually like a huge step maybe in the right direction, correcting a culture towards something that was more righteous. Um, then, but the other thing is like, while, well, some of that just seems weird to us and maybe we don't jive with it because we're not farmers. Uh, we're not an agricultural you know, community or, or whatever, uh, man, like to, to be able to look at the law and get at the heart of it. And what was it, what was God trying to communicate about how he wanted me to love my neighbor? Um, there's something valuable that, that even us today, like, as we study and look at it, like, man, should offer us some insight as to how God would call us to love our neighbors now, you know, in 2020. Um, and, and that that call is not one that can condemn us because of the gospel, you know, like no one can lay a charge against us. No one can accuse us because Jesus has taken that for us. But man, like there's beauty in understanding the law too, but, but on its own, it's just not good enough. And so our heart rests not in our own righteousness and performance, but it rests in, in Jesus' performance to fulfill the law, not abolish it, but to fulfill it on our behalf. So uh, we have a few other things listed here for the sake of time. Is there anything that you guys are chomping at the bit to get to on those last few? You guys get to leave it where it's at. I'll just say that the idea of worship and idolatry, mm -hmm. that, that man, God, he draws his people to himself that he might be worshiped. And when we worship him primarily, then, uh, and by primarily, I mean, when we worship him alone, when we give ourselves to him alone, then, um, then we flourish. That, that, is, that is what we are meant to do. Uh, and then that that doesn't just mean that we ignore everything around us and we ignore creation, but it means that that when we put God alone on the throne of our heart, we worship him, then um, then we're not putting that pressure on ourselves or any created thing to be God. So so when you're reading the Old Testament, you, you see this these idols, uh, idolatry, and, and they're literally crafting idols made of gold and, and silver and wood and and you see the prophets rebuking God's people saying you know can wood speak can can uh, can silver teach no it, it can't because it's you it's it's something that you make with your hands and you worship it like don't do that um and, and yet we see constantly we're just drawn back to worship false gods and 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 um and created things um but then um in the new testament we see uh, we see idolatry in in idol making and statues but then in in our culture that looks a whole lot more like our heart putting its hope and its um and its joy and its fulfillment and its fullness into things that that might be good creations um but aren't aren't able to bear the weight of being god yeah that's good yeah matt do you have anything to leave with at all I like all that. Um, to add to that, like we're constantly worshiping something. It's not like today we're not worshiping anything right or wrong, and then tomorrow we get to worship God. Our hearts are always drawn to worshiping something at all points in the day, and it's a matter of constantly, by God's grace, making sure our hearts are worshiping the one true king and not anything else that we might run after. And the hard part for me is to believe that, that worshiping God is the best thing, the most satisfying thing, and so, man, that is just tough, and it's a day-by-day -day battle, and it's something that, yeah, we get to constantly be aware of, but it, it is good. Um, I know, like, I had one other quote there. I don't know if it's Martin Luther or not, but he said our hearts are idle factories. Mm -hmm. and I think it's just so easy to think that our hearts aren't that bad, or, or you know, you hear the thing, follow your heart, or, well, you know, your heart will tell you that our hearts are deceptively wicked and sinful, and so to your point, Michael, we're constantly chasing after something. And man, gosh, by God's grace, hope we could chase after him wholeheartedly. Great. Cool. Well, uh, man, hopefully this stuff was helpful. Uh, if you got this far in listening or watching or whatever, uh, there's, there's obviously a ton more uh, that we could dig into, but 
maybe this gave you at least some things to be on the lookout for as you are reading the Bible, uh, again, maybe for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time. Uh, so next week, we're going to talk about uh, kind of some of the ways that we can actually read the Bible. Uh, I think many of us think there's like our devotional time that we have over here that we, uh, we sit in quietly, you know, flip through the pages of scripture over a cup of coffee. Um, and then over here, we have, you know, the in-depth Bible study where we have like 18 commentaries out and, you know, we're trying to learn Greek on our own and all that stuff and figure out all the things. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about like, th certainly those are two different things. Uh, we'll talk about some of those, but then also maybe like the fact that eh, those aren't, it's not like those are like option A and option B, but there's a, a spectrum of reading and going after God's word. And, and so we'll talk more about that uh, next week. Again, thanks so much for listening. We uh, hope this was helpful and we will see you next time.